Okay, so hello. Thanks for coming. Um, I don't think there will be any translations, um, but if there's any wording I use in English that it's harder to understand, then just raise your hand and ask me. I don't mind. Um, I don't mind stopping uh, trying to explain it in a simpler way. Um, and also, my mother's here. She speaks pretty good Spanish, so maybe you can ask her to translate any terms that uh, I don't get across very well. Anyway, um, so my name is Lewis Nyman. I'm a front end developer and I'm a designer. I work, um, well, I live in Switzerland, but I work for a company in the UK, uh, the UK office of Wonderkraut. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to support the, uh, the local community, and I'm really glad that Wonderkraut were happy to support me and pay for my flights to come here. So thanks a lot to them. Um, so I, I'm the maintainer of the seven theme in Drupal, uh, the admin theme that ships when you install Drupal. Um, and last week, I became the maintainer for all the CSS in Drupal. Um, and uh, when I when I agreed and I you know, accepted the maintainer position and the commit was made, after that, um, I thought, mm, maybe I should check and see what I'm getting myself into. Uh, so I had a look, and um, there are actually 145 CSS files in Drupal 8, and there's about 13,000 836 lines, so quite a lot. And then I thought maybe this wasn't such a good idea <laughs> um, to accept this this maintainership role, I guess. Um, and then I ran all of Drupal 8 CSS through a code quality linting tool, and um, it has about 846 errors in it. And then I then I knew that it was a bad idea to accept um, this. But I'm not going to talk about CSS really today. Um, I'm talking about the way we design the experience of using Drupal um, and how we um, how we design that user experience. Um, now, Drupal is a very flexible and a very powerful tool. Um, but with that, you have so much flexibility that you don't really have any expectations about how someone will use it. And you don't really have a lot of control over how the end user um, will use Drupal. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to design for it because there are some problems that you wouldn't get when you're designing a normal product where it kind of stays the same and you kind of have the expectations of how people will use it. So when, um, when I'm talking about experience design, I, I mean in particular like um, the way you know people experience using the software. And it's a very difficult thing um, to manage because it's not something that you can test. There's no graph that shows how good an experience is. Um, it's kind of built up of um, feelings. And um, you can't really measure feelings in that way, but you know when they're good and you know when they're bad. Uh, like you, when you taste something, you know if it's good or bad. But you can't measure it really on a scale. And it's not, it's not just enough to make Drupal possible and understandable and usable. It has to be better than that because everything that you do in your life, everything that you've done has been possible and understandable and usable. Um, like for example, if you took a taxi through Bogota this morning to get here, you know, it was possible, you knew how to do it, but it doesn't mean that you had a good experience or that you enjoyed doing it. Um, and at Wonderkraut, we have a, we have this, uh, these principles of how we design. Um, and the first thing you do is you make it usable. The second thing you do is you make it useful. After that, you make it desirable. And if you can, you make it delightful. And these are the kinds of things that we struggle with doing in Drupal when we're designing it. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more. So when you have a bad user experience, it's very easy for a user to feel overwhelmed. Like they, um, they ver they're very frustrated. They feel very helpless. They feel very unsure of their own abilities to use uh, the tool they're trying to use. And it's very easy to feel intimidated by software. Um, it's very easy to feel like that you're not, you're not good enough to use it um, or you don't have the right skills to use it. And inconsistency is also a big problem because if you expect something to happen, but then something completely different happens, you just lose confidence in yourself and you lose confidence in the tool you're using and you become very unsure about how to use it. And the problem is that every feature um, that we add to a product, we increase the, the complexity and we increase the ability um, or the potential for inconsistency, uh, which is a big problem with Drupal um, which I'll come to. So why is Drupal's user experience important? Well, it's important for, for two reasons. The first one is about 
the clients because they're the one who pay us money to work with Drupal and you know uh, it means we're able to be here and it means um, uh, we get to work with Drupal every day. And in the long run, if a client has a, a negative experience using Drupal, uh, they build up a lot of negative emotions. Um, and they start feeling uh, very bad about the tool they're using and they feel quite bad about Drupal. And they feel quite bad about the people who put them in the situation uh, where they don't feel great you know, about using the product that they use. And the thing is that um, people talk, they talk to each other a lot. Uh, clients talk to each other all the time. Um, and we know this because we know that Drupal has a reputation for being difficult to use or not very usable. Uh, the other reason is um, site builders. Um, so at one point, we're all just you know site builders. If we're developers and we're clicking around, uh, building you know using Drupal to build uh, the sites we want to build before people will learn to code. And so everyone starts out being a site builder at some point. Um, so it's really important to build a good experience for them as well. And sometimes you just want to be able to use the tool and get it working and you know, do what you want it to do. You don't want to have to learn every part of the system or every how everything works. You just want to know enough um, to do what you want to do. And one of the problems that we have with Drupal is like the amount that you need to know to know enough is kind of feels a bit like this. And this is really tough uh, for Drupal because there are so many new um, alternatives nowadays. There's loads of products out there that are really good. Their experience is really good to use. And that's all the user sees. They only see the stuff that's in front of them and how they use it. They, don't, they can't compare the code quality of Drupal or how flexible it is. They just know um, how easy it is to use. And these bad experiences of people using Drupal, they kind of refle reflect back on us as a community. And um, Drupal has a reputation of requiring special knowledge or you know you have to know the right things um, in order to use it which is a shame because you know instead of being exclusive the Drupal community is very inclusive very welcoming very friendly and the software doesn't always um, reflect that at all so I think it's kind of obvious or at least I convince you that the UX of Drupal is really important and if we improve the user experience of using Drupal um, it's gonna make a big difference in the future for how Drupal is used. So who is uh, responsible for Drupal's user experience? Um, does anyone know? Does anyone have any ideas? Um, is it designers, core developers, uh, module developers, or site builders? Does anyone know? Yeah, so it's, it's all of us. It's a trick question, but not very no very clever one. So the designers have a really important responsibility because they, um, they research and they find problems with Drupal and they can solve those problems and they can define new conventions. Um, and then the core developers who work on Drupal core, they can, um, they can implement this framework that's usable and it's extendable uh, by other people. Um, the module developers, they have to use and extend their framework and how they use and extend Drupal is really important because there isn't a Drupal installation out there that doesn't have some extra modules installed. And um, they're part of the experience of using Drupal. They're not separate. When, once they're installed, they're part of the same experience. So keeping them consistent and keeping them together is really important. And then the site builders, um, they have the, the biggest responsibility because uh, their job is to take all the different Lego blocks and plug them together um, to make an experience that's usable by the, by the client. So they have the final responsibility um, over everyone else. But on top of that, uh, the client also has the ability to feedback um, and to give their perspective and to give their insights um, so they can help improve Drupal as well. So th you know, there's good news. I'm not just trying to be really negative about uh, Drupal's user experience is making progress and it's getting better. But one of the problems is that um, the expectations of what a good experience is is also improving as well. So as we're in trying to fix our own problems, we have to keep moving forward to keep up with the expectations of new users. So I wanted to go over just a quick 
short history of uh, the past few years and how Drupal's core experience has improved. Uh, so this is Drupal 6, uh, I don't know, a long time ago. I think I, I first started using Drupal in Drupal 6. Um, it didn't have like a custom design for the admin interface. It used the same theme uh, that you'd have on, on the front of the site, um, which wasn't geared towards uh, you know configuring and creating content. And it didn't have really any usability to it. You had to go and install these modules, and you had to know the right modules that you had to install in order to make it easy to use. And if you start using Drupal uh, from the beginning, you don't even know what a module is. And you don't even know where to go to find one and to install one. Uh, so there are loads of problems with um, Drupal 6. And I think originally we did some um, usability testing, um, and the results were terrible. Um, it was, you know, Drupal was meant to be a CMS, but no one, not one user could find their content once they made it. So it was really clear, like it became really obvious to the whole community that there were big problems with Drupal's user experience in Drupal 6. So in Drupal 7, it, um, it improved a lot. Uh, we designed a custom admin theme. I say we, I, I wasn't involved then. I only became involved during Drupal 8. But um, we designed a custom admin theme uh, that was built for managing content and configuring the site. So this was a, a big improvement by itself. And then in Drupal 8, we've taken that and we've expanded on it and we've evolved it even further. But I, I want to come back to these improvements in a little bit because I want to talk about Drupal's contrib experience as well because that's an important part of the entire experience of using Drupal. So this is a screenshot of a module called, um, it's called Panels. Um, so one of the things that we tend to do uh, in Drupal is we display information in tables. If there's any information at all, it gets displayed in a table up here like this. So you have a list of contexts, and even if they have just a label and some buttons, put it in a table. And that's pretty much what we do all over the place in Drupal. Just all information is listed in a table, uh, even if it's not the correct or most appropriate way to display the information. Um, something else that um, we added in Drupal 7 is this component called vertical tabs where you can you can split up information based on these tabs on, on the, on the left-hand side. And everyone was really excited about this idea. You know, we've got this new component. We can use it to show the right information and make it easy to find. Uh, but what Panels does is it kind of takes like a vertical tab. And then inside of it, it puts more vertical tabs. And then inside of that, it puts even more vertical tabs. And then along the right-hand side over here, um, they have also horizontal tabs. And it's really hard to tell if you click on these, what changes over here. Is this relevant to that bit? I mean, you don't really know. Um, and my point is that it's really easy to take these UI conventions that we have, user interface conventions, um, and then just push them to the point where they don't work anymore. And you kind of push them to the point where they break. Um, this is another module uh, called Context. And this one, um, they decided, the module developer decided that in order to do um, what they wanted to do, with the module, they had to develop their own custom UI. So they built this user interface from scratch. And you can see like it has vertical tabs a little bit, and then it has the, um, these buttons along the side, and it doesn't really work that well. Um, but it's very difficult if you, if you need to have um, a custom interface, because the stuff that Drupal gives you isn't enough. Um, then there's a lot of work to do, and there aren't many designers in the community to help you, so you kind of have to figure it out um, by yourself. This is a, a module called Rules, and um, Rules is a very complicated and it's a very powerful module. You can do a lot with it, but the, there is really no design to it. It's just a big, long form, um, everything. Um, so there isn't really any design done at all on it. Um, and this is because the module developers don't have a lot of support from designers in the community. So they kind of have to just leave it as it is, um, and they can't really do a lot of work to improve the design and make it easier to understand and make it easier to use. Uh, views is a, another really good example because it's part of Drupal 8 now. It's part of uh, Drupal core. Um, but it still feels completely different to the rest of Drupal because it has all its own conventions and it has its own ways of using it, which you have to learn to use views. And then you never use those lessons that you've learned ever again in the rest of Drupal. Um, so these are the kind of inconsistency problems that we have. 
So we have like all these modules that have different designs, um, but we need to make the modules feel like they're all Drupal. They need to feel like they're part of the same experience. Um, but the biggest problem is, is that we have very few designers contributing to Drupal, um, like really a handful, probably under, under 10. So we can't get all these designers to go and sit with all the module developers and help them ensure that the interface is well designed and it's consistent. We just don't have those numbers. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the improvements that we've made to the user experience in, in Drupal 8, which is in the, in the past few years. So we completely redesigned the installation screen. This is probably the first like really big issue that I worked on um, in Drupal. And it's not something that you see very often. It's not something that you'd use every day, but it is the first thing that people see. So it's really important that we show them like a good first impression and it looks friendly and easy to use. Um, because once they have that first expectation set, it kind of changes how they use um, Drupal and what they expect from it. Uh, we also redesigned the toolbar in Drupal 8. So it's, it's completely rewritten from the one in Drupal 7. Um, you can get around a lot easier by collapsing um, the, the menu items. And then you can, um, it's also completely mobile friendly. So it works just as well on tablet and mobile devices as it does on desktop. So it's redesigned to work on everything. Um, we also redesigned the module page. Um, if you want to find a module now, you can just type it in and it will show up and filter the rest of the modules. Um, in previous versions, you just had to scroll up and down and look for it unless you, you knew the right modules to install to make it easier. So I think overall, in terms of man hours of developers, the, m the number of times that they have to do this, we're probably saving like days and days of time of people scrolling up and down. So that was a really good improvement to put into Drupal 8. Uh, we also completely redesigned the content creation page. So you can see a lot of the secondary information is moved over to the right-hand side. And this is information that isn't as important as your content. So you have like a straight line here of all the content that you need to place in. And the secondary information on the right-hand side, you can kind of ignore it if you want to. It's not required. Um, and this was a really good improvement because we, um, we found that if we had a, a, a long list of all the content, then every user thought they had to fill it out, that it was important. So that's why we made the change to move it to the right-hand side. Uh, we also have a WYSIWYG um, editor in core now, which is amazing. It only took you know, 10 years to put a WYSIWYG editor into Drupal. But look, you can make things bold and metallic now. It's amazing. Um, but we also implemented some basic widgets to add links um, and another widget to add an image. Um, so the configuration, the basic configuration of the WYSIWYG out of the box when you install it is, is actually pretty good. Um, and that's really good to have out of the box because you know every client asks these kind of things in every project. So it's great to have this baseline um, of settings so you can, um, you can just use it straight away out of the box. We also added this new module called the Quick Edit module. And what it lets you do is it lets you modify your content in the page when you're looking at it. So you can change any of the text on this page and you hit save and it's saved it already. So you don't have to go to the back of the site um, to change your content and you can see exactly how it's going to look before you hit save. And this is a, you know, obviously a really good improvement. It's like magic um, and it's uh, something that's tested really well and it is a really important feature to have. Something else that we've done is we've uh, redesigned the block placement page. Um, so now you can add as many blocks of as many types as you want to Drupal. So we kind of had to rebuild the, the design of the page so it supported um, adding as many as you want. So you don't just drag them around anymore. You can add, if you want to add more than one breadcrumb block to a page, you can. So that's a big functional improvement, but we had to improve the design and change the design so it supported this new functionality. So kind of like the way that we um, design uh, the modules, we also have the same problem in inside Drupal core because all the improvements that we make are separate. They're made in completely separate issues. Um, and they're made in separate modules as well. It's all modular. And what we don't have is this overview of how 
these changes and these um, improvements actually affect the entire experience and how they affect each other. Um, and this is maybe the biggest problem, is we're very good at making changes, but we're not too good at the overview. So after maybe three or four years of Drupal 8 development, um, this was a screenshot of um, the buttons we had in the seventh theme. And you can see that we have like five different styles of buttons, and none of them look any good. Um, and the problem was that all these buttons were being added in separate issues, and no one was looking at them together and saying, you know, these don't look right together, they don't match up. Um, so it was even really basic stuff like this that we were struggling to get right. Uh, so this designer uh, called Frank uh, Chimero, he wrote this amazing book about um, design and what he thinks design is um, and how he thinks it works, called The Shape of Design. And he had this, uh, this metaphor for how you use design, um, kind of like a painter. So when you're painting um, and you're making you know, brush strokes, you get very close to the canvas. So you know you're making, you're making the detailed brush strokes and you're making the right colors and you're making the right choices. But after you make those changes um, and you change the canvas, you wanna have a step back and you wanna see about how those, um, how those brush strokes have affected the entire canvas, not just the small part you're looking at. So we're quite good at doing the tiny brush strokes in Drupal, making those changes. But from a design point of view, we're not too good at the stepping back and looking at, looking at the entire canvas. So these are one of this is one of the big problems that we had to solve during Drupal 8. And this isn't something that you can fix with issues or patches. You have to change how the community works together and how they work. So um, about two years ago, um, we started work on a, a style guide for the seventh theme, which is the, uh, the admin theme. Um, and the idea behind this, uh, well, there were a few objectives behind the, uh, the style guide. Um, one was to add consistency to core and contrib modules. Like I said, it's really important that they're part of the same experience. Another one, or another two, were for it to be um, accessible, because Drupal has a very high standard for accessibility. And it had to be mobile friendly, which was, um, which was a big thing because Drupal had no concept of working on mobile devices or any other devices apart from a desktop computer. Um, so that was a big change. We also kind of wanted to update the visuals of Drupal uh, because in the past few years, uh, the mobile operating systems have kind of pushed forward, you know, um, expectations for how things look and how things work. And the expectations were much higher, so we, wanna, we wanted to update Drupal so it felt more modern. Um, so Drupal already has some brand principles about you know, how it should feel and how it should be, um, which we developed during um, the Drupal 7 cycle when we first designed the admin theme. So what we did when we were designing the style guide is we took, um, we took those principles and we reinterpreted them so we could um, base the visuals of the style guide on um, these principles. So the first one is that Drupal must be clear and direct and concise. So some of the way we display information now is um, we, have like, we have strong colors and very crisp lines in certain places to emphasize the right, um, the right information. And we also use like just the right amount of spacing between everything, so it's really clear, like the separation between different information. Um, the other principle is that Drupal must be calming. I mean, it's, it's not always calming, but it should try and be calming. So what um, we have is a lot of rounded corners. Um, you see in the buttons here, and on the edges of the, of the modal windows. Everything is kind of rounded to make it feel less sharp and less dangerous. Um, another principle is that Drupal fit should feel kind of natural. It should kind of feel like it's built by people, not built by machines. So you can see in the choices that we've made for the, um, for the typefaces, they all have like, they're quite soft and rounded corners and they're not very straight and exact. Um, but also in the, the icon set that we designed to use for Drupal 8, um, there are no sharp edges, they're all rounded corners. So it doesn't look like it's been cut by a machine, it looks like it's been made more by a person, it feels more natural. Um, another thing is that Drupal should try and feel friendly. So we found different points where we could add like bits of bright color just here and there, just a little bit, so it's not too overwhelming. 
but it just gives it a little bit more, um, it kind of feels a little bit more happier. So when you put it all together, you can kind of see that it, it looks completely different. Well, not completely. It looks slightly different to how it did before, but it's not completely different. So it's not a brand new theme. It's just kind of an evolution. So it's a slightly um, evolved design, but not a completely new design. So that's kind of where we're at when we, we redesigned uh, the seventh theme and we produced a style guide and then we implemented these new designs of visuals in Drupal. Um, but that doesn't solve every problem. So moving forward beyond that, we had to think about ways we could use the style guide uh, to solve these problems and to improve the overall experience and not just make it look a bit nicer. So the next thing we try to do is go out and try and standardize the contributed modules, the way that you know, the way people are doing things differently um, in all the different modules that you can install. Uh, so we went out, we talked to um, maintainers of modules and we try and find um, the, the UR components that they've made themselves because they need it. And we're trying to bring those things into the seventh theme so then everyone can use the same components together and they don't have to write them themselves. So one example is this, um, we have this tool tip that appears um, when you hover over the, the favorite button in Drupal, and what we're doing is we're, we're making this um, reusable so anyone can use this tooltip um, anywhere in any element they want and not just have it in this situation. Another example is this, um, this, uh, this spinner that appears in the middle of uh, views pages, which doesn't appear anywhere else in Drupal. It's just a, a views thing, but it's the only one that does it. And it just overrides the, the normal uh, spinner, um, just in this situation, which is, which is weird. Um, but the views need it that way. So what we did is we created an issue. So now you can, when you, when you have a spinner, you can choose that you want a full screen option. So it means that any module or any page can use this if they need to. And it's not just a views thing that views does on its own. It becomes a tool set or part of the tool set that module developers can use to make their pages easier to use. Another example is um, that we added to the seventh theme is uh, these layout classes. So what you can do if you're a developer is you can add these classes to um, the output of your, of your module. So if you wanna be able to lay things out on the page, you know, if you wanna have like half a column here, a column there, or like a third and two thirds, you can do that without having to write any of your own CSS. Uh, you can just add these classes and then we take care of the rest in the theme. Um, and then it keeps it more consistent and it makes it easier for module developers. They don't have to figure out uh, these problems for themselves. Um, another example, um, we added like helper uh, classes and styles um, to make it easier to emphasize information on the pages. So if you wanna make um, some text on your, on your module page uh, bigger, like a, like a heading. You can use these like head, heading B classes, heading C, heading D, um, to make it look like a header without actually using the header tags because you should only use them in the right places for accessibility. Um, or you just write your own CSS to make it bigger, which makes it inconsistent with all the other modules. So this is a really useful tool set uh, for being able to you know, make important information bigger um, without having to do the work yourself. Uh, another quick, quick example are uh, these color classes. So you can now add these classes in your markup if you wanna show that something, you know, something good's happened, or something bad has happened. You don't have to go and add those colors yourself. You can just use them straight from the seventh theme. And then you know that the colors are the same across the whole of Drupal because you're just using these classes again. And uh, beyond that, we want to develop uh, guidelines for how to use the style guide. And this is probably the most important part that we're working on because this is what we use to tell developers how to use the different parts of the style guide and how to make it um, or when to use them. You know, when to use the right components in this situation or when to use them in this situation. So some examples of some interface guidelines that exist already. Um, the one that was released for iOS 7 by Apple was really good. Um, it has a lot of emphasis on transitions and animations because that's important in iOS 7. Um, but it also has the guidelines about how to use them and when to use them. 
and it also has like a catalog of all the different uh, components that you can use. So in this example here, it tells you, you know, what, what it is, and it shows you what it looks like, um, and then it tells you when you should use it. And then it has a link directly to um, the documentation of how you would uh, implement it in code. Uh, so it makes it really easy for developers to find out what they should use and when they should use it, and then they can just click on the link to find out how to use it. This is the, uh, the branding guidelines for Ubuntu, and these ones are really good because they have a listing of all the, all the different components and the patterns that you can use. Um, what they also do is they give you special advice if you're aiming at a commercial customer, or if you're aiming at a member of the community, or if you're aiming um, the design at a developer, or if you're aiming it at someone who creates content. So Drupal actually has its own uh, user interface guidelines. Um, hands up if you've ever heard of it. No? No one's ever used it? Yeah, so this is usually a, a big problem. Um, I think every time I've given this presentation, one person has put their hand up, and I've given it quite a few times. Um, so there's clearly a problem here about how we write the standards and the guidelines, or how we promote it and we make it available to the developers. Um, so what I've done is I've taken some inspiration from uh, Twitter Bootstrap, which is a, a, a user interface framework for developers. Um, it makes it very easy for them to add their own or to create their own UI without writing any code. Um, and I'm not saying that you should use it or it's the best thing to use, but there's loads of things you can learn from it because it's really popular. And the reason why it's so popular is because it makes it so easy to use. So it becomes really easy to know like how to use all the different components that are in the framework. So we looked at this a lot for some inspiration. And we came up with a plan uh, for the seven theme, which is basically to take all the styling and split them up into their separate components. And um, we've done that now. And then the second step of the plan was to document all of these files and all of these components um, using a, a tool or language, I guess, called uh, KSS. And that stands for um, Kniel Style Sheets. And all you do is you put comments in the styling files um, and you describe the different components that are contained within those files and you give advice about how they should be used. And then you, um, this tool uh, passes these, um, or it reads these uh, comments and it creates a style guide out of it. And this is a basic example of how it can look. Um, this is kind of a proof of concept for what we can do, but we still need to put all the comments into, into Drupal and into the style sheets. So that's pretty much all the work that we've got up to so far in Drupal 8. Um, at the beginning, uh, I asked the question, who is responsible for the, um, the usability of Drupal? And I said that it's up to the designers uh, who are involved in Drupal and the developers uh, to build a framework uh, that makes it easy to use and extend. And I also said that it's up to the module developers and it's up to site builders uh, to take those tools and to build the final project around it. Because um, they have the responsibility at the end for the uh, for the final uh, product. So in the end, it's just it's up to everyone else. And we've done, that's all the work we've done so far, but the rest of it is kind of up to everyone else. Thank you. I think we have about 15 minutes. So does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, right. If you want to use Bootstrap in Drupal, do you mean like for the front or for the for the back, like the for the admin interface or for the the front of the site? No, let's let's stick to the uh, the regular. Sure. Okay. Um, so there is a, a theme that implements uh, Twitter Bootstrap um, for Drupal Seven, 
And if you want to use that theme for Drupal 8, you have to wait for it to be um, upgraded, which will take a while because um, the theme system in Drupal 8 is still unstable. So my recommendation would be to just use Bootstrap and make your own theme to implement the classes here and there. And don't rely on the base theme or don't rely on Drupal too much. Yeah, add the classes where you want to. Uh, if you if you want to do that now, that's what I recommend. Um, at the moment, yes, loads. Um, there are loads of pitfalls because um, there's still loads of changes to the markup in Drupal and to this, the styling in Drupal. So my advice is to copy all the templates that create the markup into your theme and remove all the styling from Drupal 8 and just you know, use Bootstrap or use your own because all that stuff will change. And if you upgrade, you will break stuff because those uh, files will change. So if you don't rely on them at all, then you'll be safer. Uh, and I forgot to repeat what the question was for the recording. Um, it was, can I use Bootstrap now in Drupal 8? Right? Okay. The question was in Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he didn't want to do extra work. Yeah. Okay. I guess he's the guy who asked, asked the question isn't here. Is he? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Sure. Yes. Yeah, wow, okay, that's a big question. Um, so the question uh, was, uh, Drupal is more decoupled now, um, you're able to use uh, services to just, uh, you know, use uh, the content from Drupal and pull it wherever you want, um, but there are certain problems with that still. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask that, but I remember that there's an issue to improve how messaging works. I think like to add an event in JavaScript where you can say like messages should appear in this area in JavaScript, but I don't know if that helps your situation in particular. Uh, maybe we can talk about it a little bit more afterwards in detail, and then I can have a bit more of a think, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, completely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I maybe I can help you write an issue for, you know, to put into the issue queue so you can suggest that and other people can look at it. There's one? Okay, brilliant. Yeah, it would be a big issue. You're right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Why was the dashboard module removed? Okay, so there were a few modules that were removed in Drupal 8. Um, 
and those are ones that were had very specific functionality. They did very certain things that you could recreate using um, uh, modules that are more like tools. Um, so in a project that I've worked on recently, we've um, we had some more custom requirements for the dashboard. So we didn't use the dashboard module. We used um, panels to build custom dashboards for everyone. And the dashboard module wouldn't let you do that. So some of the decisions are basically based on like, if there's a module that you can download that will do this better, then we should remove the module that does it in a very simple way in court. Um, I'm trying to think of a few other examples of uh, modules that were removed, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. But that's the logic behind it, really. They're like, try and make um, the less modules, but with the modules that you have, you can do more with them. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Um, do you want to translate? Great. Yeah. Okay, brilliant question. Uh, so the question is, how if you're a designer and you want to get involved and contribute to Drupal, how do you do that? Um, I should have really said that um, at some point already. Um, so we have a, um, so there are many IRC rooms that people use to communicate um, in Drupal. Um, there's Drupal-contribute, but there's also Drupal-usability, and that's where all the designers um, tend to discuss and talk, and you can talk to a lot of the designers who are already involved in Drupal. Um, but also there's a there's a group on Drupal, uh, groups at Drupal.org um, called Usability, where we post updates on um, usability changes in Drupal and how you can get involved. And that's another way to do it, and one of the best ways to do it, I think, is to come to a sprint at an event. Um, either at DrupalCon or at a smaller event where there are mentors who are available to help. Um, there are, there's a lot of variety of the kind of sprints you can do. You don't have to know uh, coding. You don't have to know, like, if you even know just CSS and nothing else, there's still loads of things you can do. And it's all about finding the right people to talk to at the sprints. And there are loads of people there who can help you like match up with the right people and find people who can help you get involved and help you get started. Yeah, and th there will be a recording, I guess, so we can uh, translate it later if that helps. And uh, and the sprints as well. Thanks a lot, yeah. And, and this, this Thursday, um, tomorrow, uh, there's gonna be a sprint all day. Um, I'm not sure where it is, if it's in this building or another building, um, but there'll be loads of people there who, who can help out and help people who are new uh, get started. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much. If you want to know a little bit more, um, you can ask me questions on Twitter. Um, there are tags for the style guide issues and the front end issues. And the, the website of the book by Frank Tamero that I mentioned um, is shapeofdesignbook.com. And you can go to the website and you can download it for free and you can read it online, uh, which is, is a brilliant book. And if you like the pictures of the dogs that I had in the presentation, <laughs> the website is menswearedog.tumblr.com. And that's usually the question I get asked more than anything else. <laughs>
Okay, uh, maybe next time my Spanish will be better, but thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>